Um, at the end of the talk, there'll be a Q&A session. And then uh, if you have a question, then just use Zoom's raise hand feature uh, and I'll, I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself uh, and ask the question in the usual verbal way. Um, so the talk will be one hour long and then there'll be 15 minutes more or less of Q&A. So without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Greg Moore from Rutgers, who will tell us about breaking news about topologically twisted rank one N equals two star supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory on four manifolds without spinning. Take it away. Okay, thanks. So now I have to share my screen again, right? Yes. Yes. All righty. And just that. So hello, everybody. I want to ensure everybody that I do have pants and I'm prepared to put them on if necessary. So the title of today's talk is Breaking News About N equals two star supersymmetric Yang Mills on four manifolds without spin. We could all use some news without spin. And this is work that is in progress with Jan Manscott. And we also draw on some related work with the Rutgers postdoc, uh, Zhen Yu Zhang. So I'm gonna give a non-technical introduction to the talk and then a more technical introduction summarizing the main claims. And then we'll go into the, uh, the details as listed in this outline here. So here's the non-technical summary. So we're gonna study a topological quantum field theory in four dimensions whose partition function generalizes both the Donaldson invariance and the Waffa Witten invariance and indeed interpolates between them. So the theory depends on a choice of background spin C structure. And this dependence has not previously been discussed. And it turns out to be non-trivial now we believe we've completely solved this problem, but I have to admit that I, at the end of my string math talk 2018 in Sendai, Japan, I, at the very end, I gave a preliminary report of this work. This is the very last slide of, of that talk from 2018. And it says that with Jan Manscott, we've been all, we have an alternative, an alternative measure, some previous measure didn't work, which is currently being checked. And we thought, well, okay, it's just a, a couple of weeks before we get the paper out. And then, and then, oh muse, after many years wandering or stormy seas, twixt whirlpools of singularities and monstrous mock modular forms, unnumbered toils we did endure through dark and dismal nights, till with the rosy fingered dawn and the safe haven of explicit formulae with full many consistency checks, we did arrive. That's the Alexander Pope translation for those who are wondering. And so now here's the technical summary of the talk. So we're gonna talk about a four dimensional N equals two star super Yang Mills theory. I'll define what that means later. With a gauge group SU2 or SO3. X will denote a smooth, compact, oriented four manifold without boundary with positive V2 plus. For simplicity, we'll take X to be connected, simply connected, and we'll ignore torsion in the cohomology. Now the data that are needed to formulate these invariants consist of a, what I'll call an ultraviolet coupling, a point tau naught in the upper half plane, or its exponentiated version Q naught, and what I'll call a mass parameter, it's just a complex number M. And then we need to introduce a spin C structure. I'll call it the UV spin C structure because there will be other spin C structures. And the dependence on the spin C structure only enters through its first churn class, which I'll call C sub UV. We also need an Atoft flux. So that's a vector in this vector space over the field of two elements. And finally, we need what's called a homology orientation, 
namely an orientation of H2 of XR that makes a brief appearance later, but we do use it. So now when you have all that data, you get a, a function on the homology of the four manifold. So I hope my, uh, my mouse is, is visible. Yeah, so it's, it's a function from the homology of the four manifold to the complex numbers. And it depends on these four data. And I put the new here as a subscript because we, it's good to think of it as, a, as an index or, or as a dual vector on the, on the a space of a tuft fluxus. Oh, I put, uh, I put function in quotes because it's really a formal power series. And here's the definition. So we sum over k greater or equal to zero, q naught to the k, we integrate over mk, where mk is the moduli space of anti-self dual connections on a principal SO3 bundle, p over x, with a, a second Stiefel-Whitney class equal to the Satoft flux nu and with instanton number k. And what we integrate, well, we have e to the mu of x, where mu is the famous Donaldson map from the homology of X to the cohomology of instanton moduli space. And then E sub S is a U1 equivariant virtual bundle over the moduli space, which we'll say more about later. So now special cases of this function were, dis were studied in the late nineties, but uh, those studies were limited to spin manifolds with trivial spin C structure. There's also related work by Dijkroff, Park, and Schroers from the same period. And they were studying these questions from the point of view of n equals four super Yang Mills theory, where at least on a Kähler manifold with B2 plus bigger than or equal to three, you can introduce a mass deformation, which still allows you to have a topological twisting, a Q symmetry. And so under those conditions, they were able to derive some, um, some special cases of this function. And indeed at the end of their paper, they say recently a, a contribution appeared and it would be wonderful to apply the physical methods of reference 18 to the problems addressed here. And so, well, better late than never, 22 years later, that's what we're doing. So to make the next claims, Please recall that an almost complex structure, ACS is an almost complex structure. An almost complex structure defines a canonical spin C structure. To see that, you see an almost complex structure is equivalent to a reduction of structure group of the tangent bundle to U2. And then there's a canonical homomorphism of U2 into spin C4. When we make such a choice of ultraviolet spin C structure and take the mass to zero, we recover exactly the, the waffle witten invariance. On the other hand, if we take the mass to infinity and the ultraviolet coupling Q naught to zero, holding M to the fourth Q naught fixed, then a suitably renormalized version of this partition function becomes the generating function of Donaldson invariance, which I'll call the donaldson witten function. Now the next set of claims has to do with what's called the Coulomb branch integral. So this function can be written as a sum of two terms, one of which is the Coulomb branch integral, the other is the zyberg witten contributions. I'll say much more about that. Now the Coulomb branch integral is an integral over the Coulomb branch, like it says, but writing a single valued measure, when you include this background spin C structure, turns out to be tricky. It requires non-holomorphic interactions. Those interactions have important implications for class S generalizations of Donaldson theory. But when you do that, the integrand is a total derivative of what I'd like to call a mock Jacobi form, except Dabalkar, Murti, and Zagier have already defined a mock Jacobi form. And it means something slightly different from what we have. So I'll call it a Moss Jacobi form. The value of the integral then is also related to Mach modular forms. It's a Mach modular form as a function of tau naught. And in this way, we recover the, for example, the waffle witten expression for CP2 is a special case. Finally, 
if B2 plus is bigger than one, then this function is a linear combination of zyberg witten invariants with coefficients in the ring of modular forms for tau naught. And a corollary of that is that, well, there are vanishing theorems for zyberg witten invariants that say if X is a connect sum of two four manifolds with positive B2 plus, then the zyberg witten invariants vanish and the Donaldson invariants vanish. And the same is true of the Vatha witten invariants as a consequence of these formulas. Now, mathematicians might say, well, okay, but the Vatha witten invariants are only rigorously defined for algebraic surfaces. And that's actually recent work, Tanaka Thomas and Shishmani Yao. But um, I would say that uh, the formulas I'm, I'm about to show in the next section actually should point the way to a rigorous mathematical definition of Vafa witten invariants more generally. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into more details. That was the summary, technical and non-technical of the talk. Maybe this is a good time for questions if there are any. Andy, are there any questions? There are none so far. None, okay. All right, so let's talk about the n equals two star theory. So it's a supersymmetric theory and it has bosonic fields and fermionic fields. I'll only show you the bosonic fields. The fermionic fields are in the background, working hard, making everything work here. But uh, the bosonic fields, well, the first set of bosonic fields comes what, from what's called a vector multiplet. So that's a, a connection on the principal bundle P and a Higgs field which is a section of the complexified adjoint bundle. And then the action is the standard Yang-Mills action. We hear tau naught is the complexified coupling. F plus and F minus are the self-dual and anti-self-dual projections. So metric dependence enters there. Uh, tau naught is the complexified coupling and this is a super conformal theory. So the tau naught doesn't run, it's a parameter defining the different theories. It's a conformal parameter. Then the other bosonic fields are what's called the adjoint hypermultiplet, and that's a pair of sections of the complexified adjoint bundle. And they interact with the vector multiplets in a way I could write down. Probably the best way to write it down is to use an n equals one supersymmetry formalism and write down a superpotential. So here's the superpotential, and you see it's quadratic in Q and Q tilde, and a very important consequence of that is that there's a a U1 symmetry where Q and Q tilde scale with opposite phases. We could say they have charges plus one and minus one. I'll call that U1B, B is for baryon, U1B symmetry. And the way I, the reason I wrote the superpotential this way is to suggest that the mass M is a equivariant parameter for U1 equivariant cohomology. And that indeed turns out to be the case as we'll see. So now the topological twisting is standard. We couple to a background R symmetry bundle with connection for the SO3 R symmetry. We choose an isomorphism with the SO3 bundle with connection that's associated to the self-dual two forms on X with the Lebacevita connection. And then magically all the metric dependence becomes Q exact. So the action looks like tau naught trace F squared. There's no metric dependence there plus Metric dependence is in, is in the Q of the star. Notice, by the way, that the same thing is true about the anti-holomorphic dependence for tau naught. So at least formally, uh, Q symmetry says that the action is, that the partition function should be metric independent and holomorphic in tau naught. And we'll see that's sometimes true. And we'll see some examples where it's not true. And I think we understand the cases when it's not true and when it is true. Okay, now with adjoint hypermultiplets, the topological twisting only makes sense if you couple to a background spin C structure with spin C connection. And the reason for that is that the hypermultiplet bosons, if you assemble them as Q, Q tilde star form a, an SU2 R symmetry doublet. And then that's supposed to become a spinner. And if your four manifold doesn't have spin structure, then you're in trouble. So what you do is you introduce a spin C structure. Even if it is a spin manifold, you can introduce a spin C structure. So let W plus be the complex rank two bundle associated to a UV spin C structure. And then these under topological twisting, these fields become what I'll call monopole fields, 
they live in W plus times their, the, ad, the complexified adjoint bundle. And the Q fixed point equations are what are called the non-abelian monopole equations or the non-abelian Zyberg-Witten equations. So we have a version of the uh, instanton equation, F plus plus MM bar equals zero. And then the Dirac equation, the boldface D is the Dirac operator. Um, Dirac operator on M is zero. Now notice that the U1B symmetry scales key, uh, the monopole field by a phase. And so that's a symmetry of these equations. So it acts on the moduli space. And uh, the Q fixed point set is puts the monopole fields to zero. So it's the moduli space of self-dual instantons. All right, now there are, unlike waffle witten theory, there are observables in this theory. So it's a map from the homology of X to the Q cohomology of field space. And the formulas for the observables are the same as in Donaldson theory. The Q cohomology can be identified with the U1 equivariant cohomology of this moduli space of solutions to the non-abelian monopole equations. And the mass parameter, as I hinted below, before, is a U1 equivariant parameter for equivariant cohomology of this moduli space. Okay, now we can use localization. So there's a non-rigorous localization from a non-rigorously defined path integral of the theory to an integral over this moduli space MQ, which I think in principle could be something that the mathematicians could define rigorously, this integral over MQ. And then there's localization from this U1 symmetry from MQ to the fixed point locus, the moduli space of instantons. And so that's where this equation for the generating function of the correlation functions of the theory comes from. Uh, it's, it's that two-step localization. And now we see that this, this uh, bundle, this virtual bundle E sub S is coming from the obstruction bundle for the elliptic complex of the non-abelian monopole equations and then pulled back to MK. Now it's in illuminating to do some index calculations here. So the virtual dimension of this moduli space is uh, the dimension of the gauge group, that's three for us because we're doing SU2 and SO3 times this combination of, of topological invariance and the square of the UV and C structure. And notice that it's independent of instanton number K. But a subspace is the space of, of instantons, which has in dimension growing like 8K. So clearly we really have to take it seriously that this is the virtual dimension. Now, one thing, of, one thing about this K independence is that if we satisfy the ghost number selection rule, so the sum of the ghost number charges or degrees of the forms of the observables is equal to the virtual dimension of MQ, then we expect that since this is K independent, we get an infinite series in Q naught. And that's indeed true. In fact, that those infinite series have modular behavior. The other part of the index calculation is the index of the Dirac operator, which is a minus 8K. So I would conjecture that for sufficiently large K, this obstruction bundle is just the kernel of the adjoint of the Dirac operator. We're not gonna use that conjecture, but it seems natural. Okay, now there's an interesting relation to the Waffle-Witten equations here. So what are the Waffle-Witten equations? So those are equations for a connection on a principal bundle P, a section of the adjoint bundle of P and a two form, self-dual two form in the valued in the adjoint bundle of P. And then Voff and Witten wrote those equations there where I've suppressed indices in the first equation. Now, if we have an almost complex structure, then that decomposes the self-dual two forms into a, a trivial line bundle, which I write as R underscore plus the rank two real bundle underlying the canonical class of the almost complex structure. The, and all, as I mentioned before, an almost complex structure also determines a canonical spin C structure. And then the positive chirality bundle, spin bundle uh, W plus decomposes as the uh, a trivial complex line bundle plus the canonical bundle. So now you see, you can take this two form B plus and take two components of it and put them in KR. And then another component pairs up with C 
to become an element of the complex, a trivial complex line bundle. And so in that way you can identify the, the matter fields of alpha Witten theory with the monopole fields of Zyberg Witten theory. And of course, the second of the waffa witten equations is just the Dirac equation when you make that identification and the first becomes the first equation of the non-abelian monopole equation. So I find this a little surprising, even though the donaldson witten twist of n equals four super young mills is inequivalent to the zyberg witten twist. Nevertheless, if we choose an almost complex structure and the associated spin C structure, the Q po fixed point equations coincide and so that zyberg witten becomes isomorphic to waffa witten One is not allowed to cancel Witten from this equation. Now, now we can understand these mass limits a little bit better that I mentioned in the introduction. So it's a standard fact that if you take this n equals two star theory and take the mass to zero, you get n equals four super Yang Mills theory. And it's also true as pointed out by Zyberg and Witten that if you take the mass to infinity and Q naught to zero holding this, con this, con this uh, combination M fourth Q naught fixed, you get pure super Yang Mills, at least you do in the low energy effective Zyberg Witten effective action. Okay, so now let's, let's look again at this generating function and let's take that Euler character, that equivariant Euler character, write it as a sum over splitting classes and, and expand that out so we have a sum in inverse powers of m. So now if we take m to zero, what's the leading term? The leading term is the top uh, churn class. And if we make that distinguished, if we make the choice of that distinguished uh, UV spin C structure, then that bundle E is the cotangent bundle of the moduli space of instantons. And so at least notionally, we get the Euler character of the moduli space of instantons. On the other hand, we're really generalizing Donaldson theories. So this gives me hope that uh, this kind of formulation can answer the old conundrum. The old conundrum is that, well, if we make a path of metrics on our four manifold, then the instanton moduli space undergoes cobordisms, but the Euler character is not a bordism invariant. So what do these waffle witten invariants mean? So I, I'm hoping that this point of view will help clarify that. On the other hand, if we take the mass goes to infinity limit, then the leading term is instead, instead the lowest term. So C naught is one. So we just drop the Euler character there, just put it to one and we have E to the mu of X. Well, that's the Donaldson invariance. So that expresses, that explains why that, that limit should have something to do with the Donaldson invariance. So now are there any questions before I go into the Coulomb branch? So. Still no questions. None yet. I must be extremely unclear. Uh, okay, well, uh, so why the Coulomb branch? Well, it turns out that the Coulomb branch is is the key to evaluating these invariants explicitly. Uh, sorry, sorry, Greg. Now, now we have a question. One just a came. question. Yeah. The question is, what picks holomorphic, this is from Samir Murthy, what picks holomorphic as opposed to anti-holomorphic? Yeah, that's an orientation question. So I said at the beginning that my, uh, my manifold was oriented. So that orients spinners. And so that choice of orientation, I think is what chooses tau naught over tau naught bar. It's an excellent question. All right, so the key to evaluating these invariants is, um, is to think about this Coulomb branch. And there's another motivation I have for this, which is that this theory is a very useful and non-trivial test case for a more general interesting open problem, at least interesting to me, which is to generalize the donaldson witten theory to class S theories. So in general, we would be integrating over the base of a Hitchin system in class S theories. Now here, the, Hitchin, the base of the Hitchin system is just the complex plane and a generic point there is denoted U and that's the expectation value of the Higgs field of the vector multiplet. And then the physics is described by the special geometry of a family of abelian varieties over B. And Zyberg and Witten taught us that those should be Jacobians or prim varieties of a holomorphic family of curves equipped with a meromorphic differential. And in this case, we're gonna use the good old presentation from the original Zyberg-Witten paper, where we have a family of elliptic curves 
And uh, here we've written it explicitly as a product over, over three roots, alpha i, where we alpha i is expressed in terms of u and m and tau naught. And the, the dependence on tau naught is through what are called the half periods of another elliptic curve, e sub tau naught. And you can express those explicitly in terms of modular forms, theta functions, if you so desire. It's very useful computationally. And please do not confuse the tau naught with the modular parameter of the elliptic curve EU. So if you make a choice of duality frame or equivalently homology basis for this elliptic curve EU, then it has a modular parameter. And that modular parameter is a function of U, M, and tau naught. And in certain limits, it becomes tau naught. Importantly, when u goes to infinity, it becomes tau naught. Okay, so here's what the family of elliptic curves looks like. It's generically a smooth elliptic curve, but then there are, there's a discriminant locus where it degenerates and there are three points in the discriminant locus and you can write them explicitly in terms of m and tau naught. Now we want to integrate over this space. And what are we going to integrate? We're going to integrate the path integral of the low energy effective theory, which is a U1 Maxwell theory plus N equals two super partners together with topological couplings. So the integral has this general form where B of U is a topological coupling to the signature sigma and A of U to the Euler character chi. And then we have the Maxwell partition function. So I'm going to talk a lot about these different terms. Now, first of all, the coupling to the signature looks like this. It's a product over the discriminant locus of u minus ui to the one eighth power. That one eighth power should bother you. It suggests that the measure might not be well defined, but this is a physical thing. This measure must be well defined. It's a key physical principle. So you see there's potential problems with having a single valued measure here. In fact, it's worse than that. If you work it out a little more, uh, when you work out the uh, the Maxwell partition function, basically the Maxwell partition function is, a, is some theta function like object. I will write it down very explicitly, very precisely later, but for the moment, it's a sum over what physicists, physicists call fluxes or the first churn classes of the low energy Maxwell theory weighted by the Maxwell action, which involves the modular parameter tau, which depends on u and then F sub dynamical is the field strength of the low energy U1 connection. And A looks like this. It's, uh, uh, it involves DA DU, what's A? Well, you see, both of these expressions require a choice of duality frame. You have to make a choice of homology basis and a choice of special coordinates A and AD. But this family of elliptic curves is non-trivial monodromy around closed curves on the Coulomb branch. So, and these forms transform in non, these two terms transform in non-trivial ways. They don't just transform by phases, they're modular forms. But lo and behold, this combination here is independent of duality frame up to eighth roots of unity, just like the, the coupling to the signature. Now on a, sig, on a spin manifold, we know that sigma is zero mod eight and that makes the measure single valued. But if X is not spin, the above measure is not single value. Okay, that's a problem. That's a problem that was recognized in the late nineties that we didn't know what to do about. Um, but it's really not that surprising that it's not single valued. We need to include the background spin C structure or couplings to the background spin C structure connection. We know that because we had to introduce a background spin C structure for the topological twisting, even to make sense for the hypermultiplets. So there should be extra couplings like this, where we have uh, F sub B is the field strength of the background spin C structure. So it's a two form. So we have couplings of F B squared, holomorphic couplings C of U F B squared plus D of U F B F dynamical. And indeed, Shapir and Tachikawa pointed out such couplings would have to be there for general background fields associated with flavor symmetries. But the real shock for me was that no choice of holomorphic couplings of this nature makes the measure single valued. And it took me about a year to, to get used to that. I tried a lot to make that work, but it doesn't. Uh, the resolution is not hard. 
what you should do is you should weakly gauge the U1 baryon symmetry. So the gauge group you consider is a rank two gauge group as a two dimensional Carton torus where you have U1b times G. And then you take the U1 UV coupling of U1b to zero and that freezes the vector multiplet fields to their classical values. That gives you another beautiful interpretation of the mass parameter as the vacuum expectation value of the complex scalar and the U1b vector multiplet. So this is a standard trick nowadays. I first learned it from a very beautiful paper of Nadi Zyberg and Ann Nelson back in 1993. So we now have a rank two Maxwell action, uh, F sub I, I go, capital I goes from one to two. We have FB, the curvature of the background spin C connection and F dynamical. So we have an action that looks like that. And the tau IJ is a matrix of second derivatives of curly F, the prepotential. And I call your attention to the off diagonal terms. So let's let V be d squared F dA dm. And so we have a coupling indeed of FB to F dynamical, but notice that it's not holomorphic and it's metric dependent. Again, F plus means the self dual and the F minus of the anti self dual projection. So that, that's metric dependent and V and V bar. Well, because there's a V bar, it's not holomorphic. So there's that coupling again. It's a very interesting coupling. It, uh, it, it varies continuously on the Coulomb branch. And if you take that limit, that zyberg went limit, as mass goes to infinity, then it does become a topological coupling. It becomes the, it becomes minus one of the pairing of W2 of X with uh, W2 of the low energy uh, gauge bundle. This is an important sign that Witten discovered in his paper on abelian S duality of Maxwell theory. And it's really the crucial sign which under modular transformation leads to the spin C structures in zyberg witten theory. It's an important sign. So it's very surprising to me that uh, it comes from this non uh, Z2 valued object. And that has important implications for the generalization to class S theories because it says that we do not want a Z2 valued quadratic refinement of the intersection form when we write down the partition function of the self dual form in six dimensions. All right, so what's the modern Coulomb branch measure? So it's an integral of a two form. Here's that two form again, everything in brown or maroon is, is holomorphic and psi nu, that's the Maxwell partition function that's in blue and uh, now, now the question is, well, can we show that this is single valued? Have we solved our problem? And we claim we have, but showing that is not so easy. So the first step to do that is to use a modular parameterization to identify the base of the Hitchin branch with the modular curve for gamma of two. So to do that, you go to a weak coupling duality frame. You calculate the, the prepotential using Ala Nekrasov using the instanton partition function. So at weak coupling, there's a canonical cycle inside that torus. Weak coupling is U goes to infinity. There's a canonical cycle inside that torus, uh, which defines a canonical uh, special Cayley coordinate called A. And in terms of A, the prepotential has a classical term given by this. That's what you would have in N equals four super Yang mills. Then there's a one loop correction. And then there's an infinite series of instanton corrections and the Fn of tau noughts are polynomials in E2, E4, and E6 of tau naught of some fixed weight. There's a algorithm for determining them recursively, but there's no known explicit formula for the Fn's. Now the lambda uh, and M dependence are very important to our topological story. And so, uh, in a project with Shen Yu, we went back and we carefully rederived uh, this expression and also the topological A and B couplings from the Nekrasov partition function. And I call your attention to the one loop term, the M squared log M over lambda. I was surprised to see an ultraviolet coupling lambda in a superconformal theory, but the point is that the, this U1B is not a superconformal um, gauge theory. So there is this funny ultraviolet coupling even in the N equals two star theory. Okay, so now you can proceed. So tau is the second derivative of F and A is a function of U is, well, you integrate over that canonical A cycle, you integrate the neuron differential, and then you do some modular gymnastics. 
And after you do your modular gymnastics with a triple back flip, uh, what you find is up to a simple factor of m squared, you find this what I'll call a bimodular form. It's a modular form in both tau and tau naught. And very similarly, uh, there's a formula for u as a function of tau and tau naught, and it's expressed in terms of the half periods of the elliptic curve with tau naught and the elliptic curve with tau. And this u is a function of tau. If I consider m and tau naught fixed, then u of tau becomes a mapping from the modular curve for gamma of two to the base of the Hitchin system, and it's an isomorphism. So we can think of our integral as the integral over the modular domain of gamma of two. And the three points in the discriminant locus are tau equals zero, one, and i infinity. And then u equals infinity corresponds to some point tau equals tau naught in the middle of that fundamental domain. So there are four kinds of places where there can be singularities. Okay, so now we replace uh, single valuedness on the u plane by modular invariance under gamma of two. And to do that, we still need to write all those terms in the measure in terms of modular objects. And that's still something we need to do. And so we need some identities. So the coupling to fb squared or the second derivative of f with respect to m squared turns out to be written in terms of these Jacobi theta functions of tau and v. Now v is um, the second derivative of a with respect to m. Turns out to have modular properties. And then using S duality of the measure, we uh, more precisely Jan discovered this, this rather amazing identity that if you take uh, the ratio of these Jacobi theta functions of two tau and V, then that is scale independent. It's independent of the mass. It's independent of the, of the point on the Hitchens uh, branch. So that means you can go to the superconformal point. So therefore it's equal to just theta two of two tau naught zero over theta three of two tau naught zero. And that determines V at least implicitly as a function of tau and tau naught. And we check Rick, this in a large, a, a large um, M over A expansion to a large order. So that's a pretty amazing identity and we need it to verify the, uh, the modular invariance of the measure. So now we can write everything that's holomorphic in terms of modular object. And that brings us to the Maxwell partition function. So uh, as I've stressed many times, the Maxwell partition function is a function of the metric, um, and, but it only depends on the metric through what's called the period point. So let me explain what that is. So when B2 plus is bigger than one, the Coulomb branch integral is zero. When B2 plus is equal to one, the Coulomb branch is not zero. And that Z Maxwell is frame dependent, not holomorphic metric dependent. When B2 plus is one, the second cohomology space is as a quadratic vector space is a uh, Lorentzian space. And so we can define, you can use the metric to define a unique point in the forward light cone. So it's, it's a self-dual two form. We can normalize it to square root of one and using the homology orientation I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, we can put it in the forward light cone. Okay, so it does, this stuff does depend on the metric but only through this period point J. So what is the Maxwell partition function? It's a sum over the first turn classes of the low energy photon. Here L is the second homology lattice. For simplicity, I'll put the surface observable to zero. And here's the official formula. This formula is exactly right. So it's a sum over the, over the first turn classes and the stuff in red is holomorphic and metric independent. And the second term, the e to the i pi lambda dot cuv, that's the coupling between the background spin c structure and the dynamical photon, notice the v there. And then the blue term is non-holomorphic. You see it's a tau bar derivative and it's metric dependent. So what is that thing? So E lambda J is an error function. And in case you forgot, that's the error function. And it's evaluated on X lambda. And now you see in this argument for X lambda, you see M tau's, M v's, so it's not holomorphic. And you see some vector dot J and that's the metric dependence. So it's all summarized there. Now, uh, the, so this is not exactly a theta function. It's got this funny error function inserted, but nevertheless, you can show that it transforms basically like a theta function. Now you know how everything, how everything transforms and you can check that the measure is indeed 
well-defined modular invariant. So we can now check the, the measure is well-defined modular invariant. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet. We still have to define the integral. Uh, that turns out to be a little non-trivial because you have to make sense of integrals like this one over the fundamental domain, where you have power q to the n, q bar to the n tilde with n less than zero and n tilde less than zero. That looks a little divergent. Now, when n or n tilde is equal to zero, that's something we're very familiar with in string theory. And indeed, uh, using the string theory regularization, Jeff Harvey and I you know, gave a we're able to demystify the Borchard's lifts uh, in automorphic forms theory. But this is something that goes beyond that because n and n tilde less, are less than zero. Those terms do appear. But fortunately, uh, the analytic number theorists, uh, Katrine Brinkman, Diamantis, and Ehlen, uh, had also encountered such, such integrals in some recent work. And they gave a prescription, which turns out to be very good from the physical point of view as well. And that was explained in a paper I wrote with George Korpus, uh, Jan, and Yuri Nadayev. So we use that regularization. So now we have an integral. We have an integral, and now we want to know, can we evaluate that integral? Well, here's the integral. So this is what we want to evaluate. Here's the measure. So the red stuff is all modular. The blue psi is that complicated uh, theta function-like object. Now, the way we want to evaluate this integral is by just by integration by parts. So we want to write the, the measure as d of a one form lambda. Now, since so much stuff is holomorphic, you would write that one form as, uh, as uh, that one form as d tau times all that holomorphic stuff times some g hat, whoops, where the g hat should be such that d tau bar of g hat is the Maxwell theta function. Now that doesn't look too hard, right? But here again is the Maxwell theta function and I wanna write it as d tau bar of something. So um, take a second and think about how you would write this as d tau bar of something. And if you're paying attention, you will probably say, okay, this is a piece of cake. This is d tau bar of g hat, and where g hat is this, right? That's what you might think, but uh, that turns out to be wrong in an interesting way. The point is that in this lattice, there are there's sequences of vectors where lambda squared goes to infinity. And when lambda squared goes to plus infinity, that error function goes to plus or minus one. It's just a sign. But then the power of Q is wrong. You have Q to the minus lambda squared over four. So you have a divergent quadratic in, uh, sum here. Or it's like a divergent quadratic integral, wrong sign quadratic integral. If you ignore that divergence, you will get completely wrong answers. I'll come back to what you can do instead. But one thing you can do is, is you can look at the difference of Coulomb branch integrals for two different metrics, J1 and J2, period points, J1 and J2. And then you can pull out the tau bar derivative because then you have a difference of error functions. And when lambda squared goes to infinity, they both go to plus one or they both go to minus one. And the difference between them is sufficiently convergent, vanishes sufficiently rapidly that it conquers this exponential divergence from the Q to the minus lambda squared over four. So this converges nicely which means at least for the difference of Coulomb branch integrals, you can do the integral by a sum of residues. And that brings us to wall crossing because as the contour, as you do that residue integral, as the contour approaches the discriminant locus, this error function, this difference of error functions limits to the difference I've shown here. And now if you think of this as a function of say J1, you see that sign is gonna flip as as J1 crosses a wall where that linear form vanishes. So the Coulomb branch integral becomes a piecewise constant function of J and has non-trivial chamber dependence defined by the walls. The walls are defined by the vanishing of these expressions in square brackets. And so you have this famous chamber dependence. But it's 
Now you, you might remember that there were actually four possibly singular points in this Coulomb branch integral. There were three points of the discriminant locus and there was u equals infinity or tau naught. The point at infinity gives continuous metric dependence. So uh, the general formula is a little complicated for the distinguished spin C structure. You get an expression like this, where Y naught is the imaginary part of tau naught. And you see that the continuous metric dependence goes hand in hand with the non-holomorphic dependence. Okay, so those, those two things are really uh, two aspects of the same phenomena, the same Q anomaly. So it's all looking very bad. You have this topological theory, and now I'm telling you it's got continuous metric dependence and non-holomorphy, but it's not so bad. So first of all, uh, there's a special point in the forward light cone uh, where you can actually do the integral by parts. So there's a special point where there is a G hat that's an antiderivative of the Maxwell theta function so that the one form there is well-defined, non-singular away from all the potential singularities and modular, so it has a good expansion near the cusps. These conditions determine G hat uniquely and it turns out to be what I'm calling a Jacobi mass form evaluated at the elliptic variable equals CUV times this V coupling. By a Jacobi mass form, I mean a, a non-holomorphic completion of an appel lerch sum that transforms nicely under modular transformations. Now you can do the integral by parts. You get a function of tau naught and it becomes a mock modular form as a function of tau naught. And for example, for CP2 and the canonical spin C structure, you produce exactly the mock modular forms used in the Waffle-Witten paper. So that's a, another physical derivation of the Waffle-Witten expressions. Recently, we've heard talks by uh, Pavel Putrov and Atish Dabalkar about their paper with Witten, which gives a, a different derivation starting from the n equals four point of view. Okay, and then of course, there are many generalizations. Any questions? There's one from Saigo from a, a little bit back. The question was whether lambda is the same or plays the same role as Q naught. You mean lambda is the same as lambda naught, I think. Wait, what's the question again? Maybe I didn't understand. The, the question was, is lambda the same as Q naught? Certainly not. Q naught is dimensionless. Lambda is a dimensionful parameter. Uh, we had M over Lambda. Lambda is a scale. Lambda is an ultraviolet scale. Um, okay. Uh, and now there's also uh, another question from Arnav. Uh, sorry, what's the special point J naught? Uh, let me defer that. To, that's, it's not hard, but let me defer it because I'm, I'm, I'm getting low on time and there are some other things I need to talk about. So um, and I, I can answer that later. It, um, so, uh, but there, but we know it explicitly. So, um, okay. So now I want to talk about the low energy effective theory ne near each of these cusps, these three cusps. So famously, the appropriate low energy effective theory near these cups, uh, cusps changes. We have a U1 vector multiplet coupled to a charge one hypermultiplet in an appropriate duality frame. And there's a separate contribution to the path integral of coming from the path integral of the, each of these low energy effective theories. And we add the contributions because we sum over vector. So the full sum for this function that I started out the talk with is the Coulomb branch integral, which we now know how to do. And the, um, the sum of the, I'll call the zyberg witten contribution from the three points in the discriminant locus. Now, when B2 plus is bigger than one, the Coulomb branch integral vanishes and we get true topological invariance. There's no Q anomaly. Everything's holomorphic and topological. So it's quite interesting to determine the three effective actions. So we're trying to get the effective actions in the little red regions here in this picture. Well, the general form of the effective action near UJ is expressed in terms of the local special coordinate, which vanishes at UJ. And so the effective action has the general form of a, a coupling to the Euler density, the signature density, the square of the dynamical field strength, that's the new U1 photon, the dual U1 photon, if you like, 
All of these are weighted by topological couplings, alpha, beta, gamma. And then just as before, there's couplings to the background field strength of the uh, spin C connection. And then there's Q exact stuff. And um, so now we have to do, we have to determine these couplings and do the integral. Now, those couplings can be determined, it turns out, by using a trick that I used in my paper with Witten, which is to study the wall crossing behavior from the cusp uj of the Coulomb branch integral. It turns out that that wall crossing behavior is enough to determine these couplings in, a, in a, another effective low energy effective theory. So if I let curly A, B, C, D, E be the exponentiated versions of those, then the, uh, the path integral in this low energy effective theory looks like this. It's a sum over spin C structures, which I'll call infrared spin C structures. These are the spin C structures associated with the low energy uh, photon of this theory valid near UJ. It's weighted by the zyberg witten invariant, so that's an integer, and it has finite support on the space of spin C uh, connections, so there's a finite sum. And then these A, B, C, D, E's, which are determined from the Coulomb branch are modular objects in the, in the uh, appropriate Q, uh, Q, Q parameter for the cusp UJ, and we take the constant term in that Q expansion. Okay, and there's also a prescription here for including the, um, the observables, e to the mu of x, but for simplicity, I, I wrote just with the observables put to zero. Actually, here's a uh, formula um, that gives you a sense of what the final expressions look like. So here I have included the observables. And um, this is the contribution from one of the three cusps. And there are similar formulas for the sums of the other two. So I wanna call your attention to a few features here. The kappa sub nu, well, that's a power of two in a phase, depending on, uh, on simple topological quantities like chi and sigma and CUV squared. Notice that the lambda and M dependence uh, de uh, are raised to a power which is proportional to CUV squared minus two chi plus three sigma. So for an almost complex structure that vanishes, so for an almost complex structure that better vanish because we have to take M goes to infinity uh, sorry, M goes to zero to get the waffle witten theory. Um, the other thing to notice here is that we have a sum over uh, infrared spin C structures. We have a ratio of theta functions to the CUV dot CIR. That's kind of a new term. And then we have an exponential of some modular object times the surface observable dotted into the spin C structure. Uh, and if you specialize this to K3 and put the observables to zero, this is the kind of thing you get. So Z mu uh, is uh, an overall power of lambda over M, and then a sum of three modular objects at uh, raised to this power. So theta, theta J, eta are evaluated at tau naught and they're raised to this power, 12 plus a half CUV squared. Okay, now, this looks a little like previous results. So for CUV squared equals two chi plus three sigma and M goes to zero, we recover and generalize formulae from Waffa, Witten and Dijkroff, Park, Schroers. For CUV equals zero, we recover formulae from Labastida and Lozano. For M goes to infinity and Q naught to zero, after a suitable renormalization, we recover the Witten conjecture for the Donaldson invariance in terms of Zyberg Witten invariance. So this is kind of a, an elliptic version of the famous Witten, Witten formula for the Donaldson invariance in terms of Zyberg Witten invariance. Um, and so uh, this is a generalization and a unification of these formulae from the 1990s for the uh, various invariants. Okay, so. I think I'm probably out of time. Yeah, I'm out of time. So um, uh, I will defer the last section to uh, the question period. It takes six to 10 minutes. And if, uh, if people are interested, I will go on. That takes six to 10 minutes, but I will just proceed to the concluding remarks now. So, so to conclude, twisted n equals two star on four manifolds with a spin C structure unifies and generalizes previous expressions for four manifold invariants derived from super Young Mills. 
Uh, some technical points are still being sorted out. Our, we, have a, we have a draft, it's getting long, but um, uh, we, you know, you don't know, you don't know um, till you're actually there. So, so we're still checking things. And are we going to go have to go off on another entire odyssey? Uh, I think not. Maybe some uninvited guests are going to have to be removed uh, to finish the story. But um, I think this, the end of the story is in sight. Now. In the Donaldson Witten uh, case, uh, it was interesting to generalize to non simply connected manifolds and draw implications for three manifold invariants. I wrote some papers with Marcos Mourinho about that that could be done in this case. I really haven't thought through what's involved here and whether it's interesting. Uh, mathematicians these days, you know, if I tell them about this, they just yawn. They don't really care about these invariants, um, that's all understood. They're all hot about the uh, instanton floor homology and the many, many versions of floor homology. And for us, the physicists, that's really the Hamiltonian formulation of these theories. Uh, interestingly, Witten's 1988 papers begins with the Hamiltonian formulation. <laughs> well, we tend to forget that. Um, and so it might be interesting to think about the, the floor version of these theories. Oops, wrong way, wrong way. And finally, as I've alluded to several times in this talk, uh, the derivation from six dimensions is uh, a very interesting uh, open problem. I do have slides also for making some points about what I know about the derivation from six dimensions. And if there's interest in the question period, I could, I could talk about that. Okay, so I'm done, thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. That's thank Greg. Okay, only one person's clapping. Well, I guess I did <laughs> a very good job. Um, so now it's the time for the question period. Uh, I see one question already in the chat from uh, Nadi Zyberg who asks, my question, can you discuss the remaining section? The remaining section, thanks Nadi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, Okay, here are the slides for the remaining section. So I wanted to, I wanted to make a, a few remarks about S-duality, um, which is, well, okay, you can judge for yourself. So in the SU2 theory, uh, Z nu has a physical interpretation. It's the partition function in the presence of a tuft flux nu. No problem with that. Uh, these days, we would say it's a partition function in a background field for a magnetic Z2 one form symmetry. And Nadi can correct me if that's wrong. Uh, now, the Z nu's span a vector space of functions. And we all say that, but that's a little misleading because arbitrary linear combinations, which is what's suggested by having a vector space, that's the definition of a vector space. You have arbitrary linear combinations, but arbitrary linear combinations aren't really physically meaningful. To explain that, let me, let me remind you that there are actually three distinct rank one non-abelian theories. There is of course the SU2 theory, but then there are also the SO3 theory. There are two distinct SO3 theories, SO3 plus and SO3 minus. So you can learn about that from studying the line defects or, um, or thinking about topological couplings. Now, the action of S-duality on these three theories is kind of interesting. So we imagine that there are vertices of a triangle and then T-duality is, is reflection along the vertical. So it, it permutes the SO3 plus and SO3 minus theories and S-duality well, it, it should exchange SU2 with an SO3 theory for a Langlands duality, but um, there are two SO3 theories. So it exchanges the SU2 and SO3 plus theories and the SO3 minus theory is S-duality invariant. And that was in the uh, aharoni seiberg tachikawa paper. So the partition functions for these SO3 plus minus theories look like this. Well, their theory, they're, they're, they're partition functions for an SO3 gauge theory. So we have to sum over all SO3 gauge bundles, which means we have to sum over these tuft fluxes, but we can put in a topological coupling e to the i pi nu dot rho. So again, we have a vector of SO3 plus uh, partition functions. And we have a vector of SO3 minus partition functions. 
where we have this extra phase i pi over two rho squared. Rho is, is over this vector space H2 with uh, over the field of uh, two elements. That comes from the Pontryagin square of W2 of the gauge bundle. And that term was pointed out by Aharoni, Zyberg, and Tachikawa. Okay, so we also have a vector of SO3 minus partition functions. Now, already going back to Waffle Witten, we have an action of the generators of SL2Z on the Z news has this kind of form. The Z news uh, diagonalized T in its finite Fourier transform under S. The modular weight is something we haven't seen before because we've introduced this background UV spin C structure. So the weight's that, and this is the phase. And in terms, you know, again, I stress, I keep stressing that it would be interesting to get these things from six dimensions. I would think that this is one of the easiest things to get from six dimensions, because this is kind of anomaly type questions. And, um, and now what we have is, is the following. The Z new span of vector space, as I said, but the physical partition functions of these theories only form an orbit in that vector space. And it's a finite covering of the triangle of theories. So to show you that, that orbit, let's work in the projective version of the vector space. And here's the orbit. So the orbits look like this. So the square brackets mean I'm working in the projective vector space. So I'm, that means I'm just throwing away overall phases. Okay, I can throw away an overall phase. The blue arrows are t-duality. So t-duality, for example, takes z nu su2 to z nu su2 times a phase. That's why the blue arrow is going from z nu su2 to itself and so on. The red arrows are the actions of, of s-duality. And so these partition functions live in a disjoint union of connected orbits, each of which is double covering these triangles of theory, this triangle of theories. And the, um, the orbits for nu and nu plus the second Stiefel Whitney class of X are the same connected component. Now there are elaborate S-duality diagrams in the paper of Aharoni, Tachikawa, and Zyberg. And so I would expect that the higher rank generalizations of these theories will, will have a similar coverings of the diagrams that is in their paper. And I think that's all I had to say about that. Okay. So I hope Agreed. I answered Nadia's question. I think I did. It was just, can you do that section? Yes, I answered that question. Um, okay, so for the other questions, please just go ahead and raise your hands using the Zoom. I, I saw that David uh, had his hand up. I, he did it. Maybe his question was the same, but now there's a question. Oh, no, here's David again. Okay, I'll, we'll get him. I was just going to ask Nadi's question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but we also have a question from Sergey Gukov. Okay, Sergey, hello. Oh, uh, thank you, Andy, for meeting me. Uh, thank you, Greg, for nice talk. I have a quick question about connected sums. So you mentioned that uh, cyber quitum contribution vanishes for sufficiently large B2 pluses. So uh, maybe this is kind of outside of your assumptions, but can we learn some lessons about behavior of Coulomb branch contribution on the connected sum if B2 pluses remain low? Well, you, uh, the Coulomb branch vanishes if B2 plus is bigger than one. So your connected sum would have to preserve B2 plus is, 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 uh, is less than two. I'll take this opportunity to point out that I did assume that B2 plus is positive. So the, the, the Donaldson theorem, the Donaldson vanishing theorem is about connected sum with two component, two pieces which have positive B2 plus. So you can't have B2 plus equals one in that case. So that's the, that's the basic structure of that theorem. Um, so, and the Coulomb branch integral is zero if B2 plus is bigger than one. Um, but what about B2 plus equals zero? That's an interesting case. And um, in that case, uh, in my paper with Witten, we showed that the one loop approximation to the measure should be exact. So that, no one's taken that up. It's, uh, to me, it's a very interesting problem. Uh, here at B2 plus equals one, the tree level approximation is exact. And that's basically what I was writing for you. I was writing these theta functions, tree level Maxwell partition function. But um, 
at b2 plus equals zero, there also are, are um, one loop contributions, but that's it. So in principle, we could also understand the Coulomb branch integral for b2 plus equals zero. And I would think that's an interesting thing to do. All right, uh, we had a question from Ashwin Balasubramanian. Aswin. Okay. Hello, Aswin. Yeah. Hi, Greg. Uh, so my question is about the uh, last section. Is the analog of the orbit of partition functions uh, known for any other classes theory, like say SU2 NF equal to four? Um, with SU2 NF equals four, I, I, I know the analog of the, the these partition functions here. I don't think, I don't know if it's published. Um, maybe somebody else published it, but I'm not aware of that. But I have it in some notes. So I, I could work it out for SU2 NF equals four. Okay. Um, higher rank, I mean, the, all, all the fun in, in the Aharoni Tachikawa Zyberg paper is well, these, these very elaborate diagrams, S duality diagrams for these higher rank theories. And so the higher rank versions of these, these, these formulas are definitely not known. Um, that, that could be challenging. So Marcos Mourinho and I in 98 wrote a paper about pure SUN uh, generalizations. Um, and so then you have to, well, look, you have to integrate over the Coulomb branch. The Coulomb branch is higher dimensional. They're going to be a complex co-dimension one subvarieties of your discriminant locus. So you're not going to have to integrate. You have singularities around that discriminant locus, and then the discriminant loci are going to intersect, and you're going to have further singularities. So it's it's a challenging thing. So, so but isn't the direct analog uh, the direct analog of this would be to consider higher rank conformal cases, right? Yes, 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 yes. That's what I'm saying. You could okay. you could work out these partition functions for higher rank. Um, Actually, there has been work. There has been work about the high, uh, Jan and and perhaps others, but Jan Manscott has certainly written about the higher rank versions of waffle witten invariants, waffle witten partition functions. And so, actually, I think probably the the fastest route to answering that would be to take those kinds of expressions that Jan et al. have written for the higher rank waffle witten. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Nani typed another question. Nani, do you want to just ask this question out loud? Yeah, so there was a question of SU2 with NF equals four, if I understood. But what yeah. do you mean by the analog of the orbits? You can't turn on all these fluxes there. Ah, uh, yes, I was afraid of that. Yeah, actually, Nadi's, I think Nadi's right. So um, if you, but there's still going to be an orbit. Um, so what Nadia is saying and is quite right is that if you have a spin C structure, uh, you have a non-spin manifold, then you have to choose W2 of the uh, flavor bundles to equal uh, W2 of the, of the spin C structure in order for the topological twisting to work. Um, uh, so maybe, maybe it's just a triangle and not a, a multiple, multiple covering. I have to think about that more. That, that's, that's a good point. So I also have a question. Yeah. Uh, well, two questions actually. Um, so first, so if I understood you right, you explained that in the topologically twisted version of the n equals two SAR theory, um, to put it on a general four manifold, you need a, a spin C structure. Yeah. Do you know what would be the analogous statement for a more arbitrary n equals two theory? Yeah. I um, mean, uh, so you 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 look at the so. So you look at the transformation under SU two R symmetry of the uh, of the of the matter fields, of the, specifically of. But the how about field. if it's a non-Lagrangian theory? Ah, yes, very good. So if it's not if it's a class S non-Lagrangian theory, then um, that is an extremely interesting question. But you see, we in that case it's not Lagrangian, so I don't even have fields. So right, so um, so. 
we don't know the UV interpretation of the non-Lagrangian uh, class S theories, unless, for example, you know, for the simplest, like Archer's Douglas theory is sort of a sub theory and a limit of SU2 NF equals one, right? So there's a, it's a famous result. So you can, you can tune the mass and the Coulomb branch parameter to a, to a, a complex co-dimension two point in the space of the Coulomb branch and mass. And then you approach the super conformal point. So some of these theories can be obtained as limits like that. But um, if you got a TN theory for general N, um, I don't know what the UV interpretation is. I think it's a very interesting question. It's one that motivates some people to think that maybe there are new four manifold invariants uh, associated with these topologically twisted class S theories. That is an open question. Um, now, back in Sendai in 2018, I actually gave an argument. I gave an argument that um, even though these class S generalizations are interesting, that I gave an argument that they would not lead to new four manifold invariants. But that argument, that argument was based on the idea that the partition function of the self dual two form in six dimensions is based on a Z2 valued quadratic refinement. And that's why I was stressing so strongly that this surprising violation of folklore in this coupling of the background spin C connection to the dynamical connection being not holomorphic and metric dependent and only in some limit does it become Witten's Z2 phase. Uh, that translates into the fact that you, you're not going to be using a, a Z2 valued quadratic refinement for your partition function of your self dual two form in six dimensions. And so then my argument goes, my argument from uh, Sendai goes out the window. I was assuming that kind of quadratic refinement for defining this, this partition function of the chiral, chiral two form in six dimensions. So, um, so in Sendai, I said, well, Basically, let me flash this. Um, yeah, I think this is a really important point myself. Uh, so, so I was assuming that the partition function in the higher rank case would look a little like what you see on the slide here. And the very important thing is this phase, e to the i pi lambda dot xi. So lambda is in some lattice, we understand that lattice. But if xi is proportional to the second Stiefel Whitney class, then when you do the modular transformations to the discriminant locus, you'll ultimately be summing over spin C structures. Once you're summing over spin C structures, you know you can cancel the wall crossing with zyberg witten invariants. And as far as I'm concerned, the game is up. You're not gonna get new four manifold invariants from these theories. However, as I've stressed in this talk, um, this expression is too simple. This phase, this uh, plus or minus one, I, e to the i pi lambda dot xi, is, is, is some more complicated thing. It's not gonna be holomorphic. It's not gonna be metric independent. And um, so now I'm agnostic again about whether general class S theories lead to a new four manifold invariance or not, just agnostic. Some very, very smart people with amazing intuition, you know who you are, uh, tell me that uh, tell me that it will not lead to new four manifold invariants, but I need a scientific argument. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions? We have time, I think, for one more. Or going once, going twice. Ah, one more question from Shayar. I unmuted you. Hi, uh, I thank Rick for the nice talk. Well, one is a question on this slide is gamma, what, what is sigma here? Is that a zyberg witten curve or? I, oh, don't, don't worry about this, Shari. These are slides from another talk two years ago. I see, <laughs> okay. So the, the actual- <laughs> the, the point I was making is that it's some kind of theta function like object, the phase, the plus or minus sign in the front is, is extremely important. It comes from a quadratic refinement in six dimensions of the uh, third cohomology, third integral cohomology of the six manifold. Uh, there's a prescription for writing the 
the partition function from six dimensions, but what I'm saying is that the standard quadratic refinement is not going to give the right answers. What they say? Okay. Um, so okay. So the actual question was on this uh, bimodular form that you uh, talked ah, yes. about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it uh, uh, well in the case it has uh, it's well it's of bi weight zero? Does it give you a Green's function? I, I sorry, I can't hear you. So in the in the case that the bimodular form is of bi weight zero, that it's a function in both variables, um, does it give yes. you a Green's function? Is it a Green's function? Yep. Well, we could act on it with dd bar, and you know there'll be some delta function. Um, it's probably too far back to find it. Uh, it might be, but um, I haven't I haven't needed to use that property. So I, I the the simple answer is I don't know. Okay. It's not really. I mean, uh, you don't expect it to be a mass form. That was. Uh... Oh, no, 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 it's holomorphic, it's not a mass form. Nice Here we are. Are you talking about this formula? Uh, I think it was V tau and tau naught, the... Oh, 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 oh. That thing, V. Yep, yep. yeah. Uh, no, V is not singular at tau equals tau naught. V goes to zero as tau goes to tau naught. It's de oh, that, is, that is definitely not a Green's function. Sure, but one over V. One over V? No, no, no. Uh, v is not singular. Oh, I see. One over V. Uh, well, maybe. Okay, yeah. Because so V vanishes like tau minus tau naught to the one half power. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So V squared will have a delta function if you act on it with D bar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One over V squared will have a delta function if you act with D bar. All right. Thank you. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much, Greg. Yep, thanks. And so thank you all for coming. Our next talk is in two weeks. So next week, uh, uh, because of string math, we won't have a colloquium. So in two weeks on August 3rd, our speaker will be Sakura Schaefer-Nameki. And I hope to see you there.